this session is going to be asking, do we live in a top shelf society? My name's Susie Dean. I'm going to introduce our panel in a moment, uh, but I think it's worth outlining what this session is really about. And I think the, the discussion we'd really like to have is, is one that unpicks whether or not the per pervasiveness of sexually explicit uh, material has devalued sex and relationships. So when you think about the kind of Fifty Shades of Grey, the fact that most women think pole dancing is an exercise regime, um, and you can't turn on the TV without Rihanna, Britney, or someone like that uh, dancing in their knickers. So is this a problem, or actually is this just ex exhibitionism that's always existed? When you think about Elvis Presley and his gyrating hips, you kind of get the picture. So is it a healthy impulse, or is it an unwillingness to exercise good taste? I'll introduce our speakers in the order which they're going to speak today. Um, on my immediate left is Anna Percy, who's a feminist performance poet, and member of the Stirred Feminist Poetry Collective. She also organizes and facilitates live poetry events and workshops around the country. To my immediate right is Neil Davenport, who's a writer for Spiked and head of sociology at JFS Sixth Form Center. And then to my far right is Dr. Jan McVarish, who's a research fellow at the Center for Health Services and a founding associate at the Center for Parenting Culture Studies at the University of Kent Canterbury. I believe with the mainstream availability of pornography that the iconography, language and semiotics of pornography have seeped into our cultural products to an egregious degree. I believe these are symptomatic of the way that our society views women and their bodies. I'm not saying that pornography is a problem, I'm saying that uh, the way in which it's seeped into our cultural products is an indicator of the, the view that the general public is on the whole porn literate. Um, the examples that I'm going to use are from advertising. I am in no way saying that advertising is the problem. I'm just using these as an example because they are a form of culture that everybody views. For example, there is a still running ad by Virgin, um, the, the airline, and it uses imagery such as tiny female air stewardesses circling the phallic gherkin building and another stewardess handing out ice cream and then dissolving into a money shot. There is a Ryanair advert that got pulled because the advert showed women posing in their underwear with the headline, Red Hot Fairs and Crew, one way from 9.99. These were shown in national newspapers all over the country. Uh, Ryanair students put up a petition called Stop Selling Your Staff on change.org because the image of uh, the crew member in their underwear with the tagline implied they were included in the price, and she found this offensive. Uh, there is an advert from June 2012 from uh, Rustlers selling processed meat products. Uh, fit as a butcher's daughter. Uses entirely the form of a softcore porn video. Women dressed in apron and stockings. You know the script, boys. It's just you, me, and uh, plenty of well-hung meat and refers to her baps. There are a series of these on YouTube. Uh, there was uh, a Lynx ad in 20. 11, which got pulled, featuring Lucy Pinder, the glamour model. There were all kinds of uh, videos on YouTube, again, of her just basically stroking her breasts. And billboards on side of, and on sides of buses uh, that were pulled because the advertising standards agency said, we consider that the various activities that Miss Pinder carried out were presented in a sexually provocative way, and alongside the focus on Miss Pinder's cleavage, were likely to be seen as gratuitous and to objectify women. I think that, that this has led to certain things, the idea that women's bodies are always up for grabs and they're always available, um, which things like the uh, recent scenario with uh, Kate Middleton's breasts being shown in, in, in all kinds of newspapers and magazines, and the idea that lots of people thought that she should just put up with it because she's a public figure and we deserve to see her breasts, and I thought that was appalling. And I think that's led to certain things like uh, called creep shots where men take... Uh, pictures up women's skirts and down their tops without their knowledge and post them on the internet. And I think that it basically shows young women that all they have to offer is their bodies. It's not a true sexual permissiveness. It is about women showing off their bodies as products for men for their consumption rather than their own sexual pleasure. For example, the film Blue Valentine, Ryan Gosling has said in various interviews that he believes it was given an NC-17 certificate because it features a scene where he gives... Uh, another character, Cunnilingus, so he is giving a woman pleasure. So instead, normally, that film would have had a 15 or a 12A certificate because we are so used to seeing women being used sexually or beaten um, that those things are not considered to be pornographic or uh, deserving of a higher rating. However, a woman receiving pleasure is. Um, I could go on forever on this, but basically my idea is that uh, the way in which pornography has become a sort of shorthand in our society means that we no longer 
well, no, not that we ever have, um, allowed women to be truly sexual, to truly express their sexual desires for themselves only. I think over a decade ago, I first became interested in this as a particular area of discussion and debate. I think it was noticeable that the content of television was becoming eyebrow-risingly uh, coarse uh, and sexually graphic. And I think the once closed off and rightly privatised domain of top-shelf magazines was becoming sort of background uh, wallpaper in society. Now, of course, this issue of television content and what should be deemed as, as appropriate or inappropriate on television content, uh, and in particular the stylings of racy pop videos, is nothing new at all. You know, it's, it's been raging on for decades. And I think, in some ways, there are direct parallels with similar debates in the 1970s over the increase of sex shops, increasing pornography and nudity uh, and on television. And I think it, perhaps it would be worth exploring whether there isn't anything uh, new here or that there's nothing we should be uh, that worried about. And uh, hopefully Jan will perhaps explore that side of it. Um, I think it's true to say that the sexual content of some programmes, at least in the language uh, that's used, particularly in comedy, is definitely a lot stronger uh, than in the past. I think for television producers, there seems to be an endless search for breaking taboos and boundaries over sexual content uh, in TV programmes. It seems to be the one area where producers feel, you know, kind of compelled uh, to prove their edginess in today's climate. But I think what's sometimes overlooked uh, is how the boundary between public and private, I think that's an important boundary, often, see, you know, often seen as a hallmark of a civilised society, uh, is the one that's been chipped away at. So I think so alongside the top shelf content or the privatised world porn being seen as acceptable in public. However, what we consume in private or how we conduct personal relationships in private are viewed with suspicion. Uh, as an ex-News of the World journalist said recently, privacy is for pedos and for those with something uh, to hide. Uh, and that private relationships are often promoted as unregulated uh, arenas open to abuse, violence uh, and unhappiness. So it is this assault on the private sphere and on private relationship that goes hand in hand with the acceptability, if you like, of top shelf content uh, becoming public that I think is the unique aspect to the current uh, period. I have no objection to sexually explicit material being available and I'm completely opposed to any censorship, but it is the context of the erosion between the public and the private that I think is perhaps worth exploring. Uh, nevertheless, it does also raise the question, well, what's the big deal? Surely a few, a few sort of crude uh, jokes on TV uh, the increased availability of uh, lap dancing clubs and sexually strong empty vid videos. What's the big deal? Is it the case of becoming more prudish as some of us get older? Um, I don't think it is. I think there's an awareness that we, the public's intelligence and taste, is being mocked by what's sometimes seen as overgrown uh, schoolboys. So when Jonathan Ross asked Thatcher whether he'd ever jerked off over Thatcher, uh, the BBC, in deciding to broadcast that, assumes that we are also a bunch of puerile tossers. Uh, the same was true with the Ross and uh, Russell Brand phone prank on Andrew Sachs uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I think what's now becoming predictable is that anyone who questions this is just written off as, as being Daily Mail and old-fashioned. Uh, in, in recent uh, years, there has been a self-regarding divide, dividing line uh, between them and us, liberal radicals who want to shout out knob gags and those of us who don't want to hear them all the time. It's assumed that society is divided between those who are broad-minded enough for taboo busting knob gags and everybody else who is too straight-laced and old-fashioned to get it. It reminds me of the comments that Hannah Arant once made that uh, elites who are isolated from wider society end up flirting with the bottom of society as a way of mocking and sneering uh, the civilised society that they are supposed to be upholding. I think I'm perhaps coming at it quite differently. I, I, I think that actually there's more ways to be a woman than there ever has been. Uh, and I think this this conference is quite a good uh, example of that. So I would argue that we don't live in a top-shelf society or a pornified society. I think the idea that we live in a top-shelf society suggests that pornography is more influential than anything else. And I think this idea is the product of a sexualisation of politics rather than an accurate description of social forces or even of daily life. So I don't think that sex has become a, a wallpaper of everyday life. And in particular, that was the phrase that the Bailey Report used to describe the sexualisation of childhood. I don't see 
see that um, going about uh, my daily life. I think in some ways this is, is what this reveals is an obsession with the media and the media talking about itself that doesn't actually touch real people's concerns. Again, something that the Bailey Review acknowledged, that actually most parents are really not particularly worried about the sexualisation and commercialisation of society. In some ways that's a, a wallpaper concern. It's not a priority for them. I think that, secondly, that the way in which a sexualisation of society is talked about is usually that it's put in tandem with the, the idea that there's a commercialisation of society and, again, that this is total. And those two terms are used interchangeably as an unholy alliance. Uh, but nobody explains the relationship or why it came about. It's enough now just to say we live in a sexualised society and this is a bad thing. Uh, so, for example, there's a real incoherence to the response, for example, to the uh, marketing of, apparent marketing of padded bikinis in Primark for prepubescent girls or the Tesco pole dancing kid. As soon as people investigate these things, they turn out not to be what they look like. Secondly, I think there's an example of this incoherence in the, in the sexualisation of, of childhood discussion uh, in general, where the talk is, made, is of, of grooming children. Agnes Nairn wrote a book about the commercialisation of childhood, in which she used the language of, sort of sexual predators to describe what the market does when it seeks to carve out markets uh, amongst children. There's the talk about corporate paedophilia, for example, in Australia, where people are campaigning against uh, certain sort of media phenomenon. And over here, uh, one of the responses to the Primark bikini scandal uh, was that, that somehow this is the evidence of the paedophile pound. Um, so I think these uh, things are wrong and they don't really describe uh, the society that we live in. Thirdly, I think the idea comes from those, uh, the commercialisation, the sexualisation kind of bandying around, is that these malevolent forces, are, uh, they're blamed for tainting our intimate relationships with one another, um, our relationships with our bodies and our sense of who we are. Um, and I think what this does, while there might be an element of truth in this, I think this overrides our will, our passions and our capacity to make choices. Uh, and these, our capacity to do this are then rendered meaningless or, or toxic by these kind of nebulous social forces that apparently are all dominating. What this then does is it creates a space for moralising entrepreneurs, uh, child advocacy groups, sexual politics uh, advocacy groups, who claim a superior ability to understand these aspects of our lives and to interpret them for us. Uh, so parents are told, for example, that they lack the skills and confidence to help their children to negotiate a new sexualised or hi even hypersexualised culture. So in that sense, I think these ideas, unchallenged, estrange us from the presence and our capacity to negotiate our way through it. I think there's a convergence between right-wing pure Puritanism and left-wing and feminist anti-sex sexual politics, uh, which has allowed for uh, the overriding of old religious-based moralising around sex based on shame and guilt to move into a moralisation that's based on a physical and emotional health concerns and the idea that these are the things that are at threat uh, from unbridled sexual passions. Uh, and my evidence for that is amongst my undergraduate students, uh, their willingness to submit themselves to sexual health checks is something that I find incredibly surprising and incredibly um, uh, disappointing in many ways. Uh, they also talk about this new phenomenon I'd never heard of, which is that they disapprove of unplanned sex. Uh, we used to talk about unplanned pregnancy being a problem. They now accept the idea that somehow unplanned sex is also something that's uh, morally irresponsible. Uh, so I think this preoccupation with uh, uh, trying to sanitise sex and create it into something safe is very, very problematic. Anna, I guess the... the the question that's in my mind is the extent to which women also encourage that sexy marketing. You know, as far as I'm concerned, Kate Middleton's breasts being in Heat magazine, a magazine which women read, or Closer, or whatever it was, has got more to do with the fact that women are obsessed with other women's weight um, than it has about men wanting to uh, ogle her breasts. And actually, even if you put that aside and you think about, you know, the, 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 the advertisements you talk about with Virgin and all the rest of it, um, isn't it true that women can also enjoy that sort of... Uh, you know, sexy advertising, uh, you know, so, so that, that would be my question uh, to you. Neil, you, you were talking about the kind of differentiation between the, the public and the private. Um, isn't there room for uh, privacy and pornography? And Jan, it would be really great if you could explain a little bit more about what you meant by politics is pornified rather than, um, rather than porn kind of taking over. I would say that I think what happens when uh, women are complicit with this idea of they want to see Kate Middleton's breasts, they want to see close-ups of other women's cellulite. That is what, I, what is referred to as internalised patriarchy. That, that they are taking on board the ideas of that they should be interested in these things. And I would say that the thing is, is that 
you know, women should be interested in sex. They should be interested in their own bodies, and they should enjoy sex, and they should enjoy themselves for their own sake, not because of what they look like or how they appear to other people or other women or other men. They should just enjoy their own sex life and their own bodies for themselves, and I think that's the problem. So you feel comfortable telling women that they sh shouldn't want to look at other women's breasts? I'm not saying that... that, that I, I'm not saying that... <laughs> there is... It's not the same as, say, looking at a naked body. It's just this horrendous thing of high close-up, of airbrushing, of things that are unreal and unrealistic. And I think that's the problem. Is it's If you had, um, you know, in magazines, you had wonderful spreads of all different naked bodies, that would be great. But that's not what happens, is you have these completely bizarre images. And I think that's what I find really weird and offensive. And why should you be interested in, in you know, this, this super high close-up of someone's bottom? But, but you feel comfortable, um, you know, you're, you're a feminist, it's all about female empowerment. You feel comfortable telling a woman what she should think as opposed to... You know, I mean, this is, in, this is in all of these magazines because women want to read about it. And whereas I, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that it's not a great thing to look at, isn't it more damaging for the feminist cause to tell women what they should and shouldn't want to look at? Uh, well, the feminist cause, as we know, no longer have a cohesive feminist argument um, because uh, we discussed this last year in a panel called Feminism Now, where five women all disagreed with each other. So I am saying that I'm talking for me and my point of view. Okay, so thank that's you. It. <laughs> Neil. In the 1970s, there was a number of very unsuccessful campaigns by the states to censor uh, pornography. And the reason why they collapsed is that the, the general consensus in society amongst, amongst adults is that there's nothing wrong uh, with having po uh, pornography uh, in private. There's nothing wrong with adults buying pornographic materials uh, and enjoying that in private. And that, you know, that, was the, that was the general consensus in society. And so all these obscenity cases were were kind of thrown out. But equally, I would say, this is where I slightly disagree with Jan, equally today, I think adults would just become uneasy with that, that type of material just being in the public domain rather than where it you know, traditionally was, which is the private domain. And the reason why they become uncomfortable, and it's not one or two individuals, I think the Russell Brand case uh, attracted some like 40,000 complaints. And right, you can say it was stoked up, but I think it became an outlet for people's unease with what they feel is being mocked. Uh, and, that's, and that's a peculiarity with, with sexual material in, in, that, in that way. It's a bit like, you know, the, you know, the lap dances. I would say, you know, a lot of men feel a bit, a bit insulted by it as well in the sense that it's a sort of a mocking kind of leeringness. And, uh, and that particularly comes across, uh, in, you know, in things like Jonathan Ross and, and just other uh, content as well. And I think that's the, that's, the, the, that's the difference. And also... I mean, I'm not advocating being a moral entrepreneur, but I'm just more worried about when people like Charlie Brooker are, are kind of, you know, leering, sneering at what they see as the narrow-minded, uptight masses, where in actual fact, uh, what they object to is just being patronised and, and what they see as, you know, they're, they're seen as not having, you know, been broad-minded enough to accept this. And I think that's where they do have the capacity to see through this. I don't think it's the case that people need to be protected from it or anything like that. Um, Jan made the point about the capacity to see through this. They do, and I think that's why they object to it in the sense they would happily with porn in private, but when it becomes used as a vehicle in society in a slightly leering way, I think it does make people feel a bit uncomfortable. Well, what I mean by politicisation of, of pornography, I suppose, is I don't really mean it all that po politics has become pornified. I do think that politics is peculiar, peculiarly obsessed with bodies in general. And I think sex kind of wraps into that in many ways. I mean, I, maybe it's just the way I come at it, but uh, I do think that, you know, when I look at, for example, you know, sort of the concerns around sexual health uh, and people's reproductive habits when and when they have children and how they have sex, I think that does demonstrate a, a preoccupation amongst the political elite and the media as well. And the media uh, is one other sort of facet of, you know, this kind of um, obsession with the, uh, with the bottom, if you like, as I think Neil said earlier, uh, maybe literally bottoms. <laughs> but the, um, uh, you know, that sort of obsession with the body goat comes across in all kinds of ways. And that comes across just as much in sort of the pressure to screen, uh, to health screen, also the, the pressure to, for example, uh, elaborate on what consent might be in sexual situations, I think, the politicisation of that and the campaigns around body, body image that um, uh, politicians are very keen to attach themselves to, I think really play along with this idea that this is all there is in life, that the body is it. And I, I, I would disagree with Anna in the sense that, you know, that really what we need is the, you know, the kind of freedom to enjoy our, our sex life, our bodies. I think that that's something that... Um, 
it, it, to me, it always sounds like it's about you as an individual. And I think the, the really good thing about sex is it's usually quite a good opportunity to get to know somebody else. Um, and when it isn't that, I think there probably is something slightly unhealthy about it, perhaps. But obviously, that's, it can be um, and something adolescent about it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's taking advantage of a lack of opportunities, if you like, and developing that area of our sort of sexuality. Do you want to come back on that, Anna? Well, I just... I didn't mean it that it was uh, just a personal obsession. I mean, of course, as you mentioned, sex is usually a group activity. Um, and I think that it should be about two people in enjoying the act itself. And I think that's kind of what I was focusing on more than, say, an obsession with the body or, or what it does or what it looks like. It should be about enjoying the activity itself between two people and both people getting pleasure from it. I think there's far too much focus on men's sexual enjoyment and not on women's sexual enjoyment and I think this is something that has been discussed from the beginning of feminism and, and will be continue to be discussed and I think it is a serious problem and I think it is something that um, within, within cultural ideas of sex it's always about one particular sex act between a man and a woman um, and a man's role in that rather than all the different permutations of sex which everyone um, does and gets enjoyment from and I think it should be it should be about enjoying the act rather than um, you know focusing on what people look like in Leeds Salon we tried to pull off a, a debate in June on lap dancing all the licenses came up for the lap dancing clubs in Leeds because the licenses has recently changed from entertainment venues to kind of sexual entertainment venues we generally wanted to look at what this says about society we, we invited the aunties onto the board May, who kind of bottled it and we had to pull the debate at the last minute. They're mainly made up of Labour councillors and Labour MPs who are kind of morally kind of pontificating on this issue but don't really want to uh, discuss it. And what, what we want to look at is what kind of this said about the society. But also, I was interested in why did lap dancing clubs arise? Where, where did this phenomenon come from? I think it's, it's kind of generally on the wane now. For instance, in Leeds, there was going to be a new lap dancing club that had up to 100 girls working in it, that's not going to open now. I think it's something that's maybe coming a bit passy. I also wanted to look at maybe part of the reason of, of how this phenomenon came about was a kind of supply side. And I wondered whether the supply side for lap dancing clubs was tied to the desire to have 50% of people in higher and further education. The first report that was done into lap dancing clubs was by uh, two sociologists at Leeds University, Teela and Hardy, who in the, they interviewed about 600 women and found out that 25% of them were in at university. A third in total were in some kind of further education. There's only so many minimum wage uh, shelf stacking jobs and bar jobs to kind of uh, go around. So maybe there's a kind of like supply side that enabled these clubs to, to thrive. Just going back to the Kate Middleton pictures, the topless photos, um, I... The, when the, the guy who took the photos, the photographer, was interviewed on the news, um, one of the things he said was, oh, she's, she's pretty and she's not fat, therefore she has nothing to hide. And I think that just because someone is deemed pretty, then they have no right to privacy. That, is, that means society is in a horrible, creepy place. Um, and also, I just wanted to... Um, there's been... There's been a lot of publicity of the, take, the, the taking down of the Unilad website recently. I don't know if, um, if anyone knows very much about this, but it's, it's, this website has been taken down. Um, and at universities, you, especially the one I go to, which is about 70 to 80% male, it definitely feels like, um, on my course at least, it feels like girls are not... You, you get the impression through other people that girls are not there to learn, they're there to even up the ratio, which is very strange. Um, and I just wanted to know whether what the panel's views are on uh, the specifically the position of women at universities. Quite interested in this debate because, quite frankly, I look at Close and I heat and I think this is completely bonkers. I don't give a damn what you're wearing on a Saturday morning. But I think it ties into a more kind of general um, trend of the inf infantilization of adults. And there is a certain hysterical overview to cause and effect. You know, well, if you, it, 
what about the children? You know, if you, if you produce pornography, you do this, you behave like this. Women will automatically go away, starve themselves. Children will pick up on this. And it's what has happened to this concept of you know, adulthood. You know, this is a private interaction with some wider public involvement with it. But it, it, it shouldn't have any relevance on our day-to-day -day living. I just un don't quite understand why this has become such a debate, which seems to go between the, you know, the Daily Mail's obsession with protecting our children and at the same time their side column on what X, Y and Z is wearing at wherever they're wearing. And often they are, you know, hasn't she grown up? Hasn't she, you know, what does she look like now? I just don't understand how this has become quite such an overriding and problem in our society and whether or not it actually is. It might be worth moving the discussion perhaps a little bit away from pornography because I think there's something else going on because if you ever watched Italian or Spanish TV you know in time immemorial it's been far more pornographic than, than British TV and there's something else going on and I think it's just a general level of crude, crudeness um, and perhaps sex and pornographic images can be one part of that um, and I feel particularly, I'm not doing a uh, confession here, that it's, it's my age group, okay? It's, it's, it's a group of people that came of age at a particular time that are now controlling these things, the producers, a lot of the journalists, a lot of the editors, um, who find it very, very difficult to articulate a sense of adulthood and what that means. And this general frivolity and crudity is taken up as a mechanism of operating. Um, and it's that confusion about what they mean or their inability to articulate a sense of adulthood, which has this impact where things become organised around a basis of crudity and you're sort of cocking a hoop at um, normal society. You don't know where you stand in terms of your relationship to, to adulthood, um, but what you do know is that you can use crude images, um, including pornographic images, to cock a hoop at the sort of mainstream, normal, middle Britain society. You only have to look at rubbish like BBC Three. If you ever watch BBC Three, I'm not Mary Whitehouse, but look at BBC Three in the way that it's the, the, the crudity and the levels of crudity are done very systematically and designed to articulate something. And I think that might be worth um, dwelling on rather than focusing on pornography. I'm no expert on lap dancing uh, clubs. I mean, I, I think it is the economic reason because when the Guardian have run interviews with why women, you know, decide to be lap dancers, it is because of the you know, power fair student loan and there's the, there's the money side of it. So you could say that as a kind of voyeuristic sexuality becomes acceptable, there's probably less of a stigma for women, you know, engaged in that, in that, in that type of employment. That's my kind of instinctive guess on it. On the question of what is this all about, it's a, a pretty good question, really. I mean, going back to my introduction, I do locate it in this the topsy-turvy collapse between the public and private. About 15 years ago, sociologists were banding around the feminisation of society which we've tended to forgot about. And what the feminisation of society was, was uh, alluding to was not the advancement of uh, women's rights, but it was more about the preoccupation of the private sphere uh, becoming more dominant uh, in society. And I think that that's part of it as well, whereby uh, uh, the obsession with your private lives in the private sphere uh, has become you know, a, a bit more widespread. And I think what's also happening is that there is a general sense that if crudity and sexually explicit material is available in public and everybody is kind of regulated in public, it leads to uh, the question, well, why would you need to consume that in, in private? Why, you know, there wouldn't be a necessity to have that in private. And that has actually come about in some cases. There, there was a case eight years ago whereby uh, a serial killer, it was reported that he, he had private pornography as if it was a, you know, a real serious issue. The point that they're trying to get at was privacy and the problems of privacy. Uh, and I think that's what's driving it as well. I agree with what the speaker said at the back about it is crudities, and I think it's society's uncomfortableness with traditionalist sections in society. Uh, and where I'd actually locate it, it's a bit similar to the gay marriage discussion as well, whereby you're forced to take a, take a line uh, in order to prove that you're, you know, you're anti-traditionalist or you're hostile to traditional uh, sections in society. And I think, I think it's kind of similar, it's got elements that are similar uh, to that as well. One thing I wanted to mention about lap dancing clubs is that it's well known that they are places where unlicensed sex acts occur. So it's, the fact is it's not just the dancing that happens, it's what goes on in the back room. And I think this is something that is well known to many people who um, are lap dancers or who um, 
know about these clubs. It, it is something that happens and people don't like to talk about it and maybe that is one reason why the Labour councillors did not want to discuss it in public because it would be admitting that there is prostitution going on in these clubs because that's what it is, is prostitution. And, it's, and to me that's what is most appalling about it. Um, and that's all I wanted to say about that. I wanted to say that yes, we do need to protect the children um, because children kill themselves because things like this happen, because of the society we live in. There was a young woman called Amanda Todd, who was a Canadian young lady, who was 15, and she killed herself because when she was 13, she was encouraged to show her breasts to a man who took a photo, who spread it all over the internet. And this had followed her for two years through several changes of schools, through harassment or by her peers and by adults. And the fact is it was an adult who used this photograph. And as far as I know, he's still not been prosecuted. And I think this is why we need to protect children. And the thing is, okay, you'd say this is an isolated incident, one girl killed herself. But if you go and look, since that story came out, there are more and more women, young women coming forward, younger than me, saying that, that, that they have had been in similar situations. That because of the attentions of an older man, they had showed a photograph, that, or even to their peers, a photograph that they thought was private. And it was not private. And it was shown online, and it was shown to other people. And I think this is why we need to protect children. And I would also, the other thing that I really wanted to say is that as women, our reproductive rights are consistently being undermined. In this country, we're currently having a discussion about whether or not to reduce the abortion limit to 12 weeks. And yet, in Northern Ireland, we have the first abortion clinic opened the other week in Northern Ireland. You are not allowed in Ireland itself to have abortions for any reason, not even medical reasons. So if you need to have an abortion because the baby is killing you, or the baby will be born dead, or will die shortly after birth, you either have to carry it to term or die, unless you go to the UK. So I think this is, these are the things that, that we are unwilling to um, deal with the repercussions of sex on women. And I think that's one of the things that I uh, feel very strongly about. Anyway. On the lap dancing thing, I mean, you might be onto something with, the, you know, if there were better student grants, there would be fewer <laughs> lap dancing does. But I, I also wonder whether there's, and this is speculative, um, you know, people are single for longer. And I do wonder whether people actually aren't having enough se actual sex. <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe that's why pornography is so popular as well. I, I do suspect that, you know, the more time you spend actually having sex, the less time you've got to sit at your laptop looking at other people doing it. And, you know, I do, you know, I, I sort of think that there's something about people, and this goes into the infantilisation uh, point that's being made about, you know, how we're living our lives, which is we're kind of delaying the real stuff. Uh, until later and later. She's not saying we'll be virgins until 30, but I presume there's only so many people you can pull in a week uh, <laughs> to give you, uh, you know, and certainly my, my impression I get from campuses is really that it is really not a highly sexually charged uh, atmosphere. If anything, it's a very, very uh, sort of prohibitionist uh, atmosphere that I feel that comes across from students, and a very fearful one. But at the same time, I think the thing that confuses us is that there's this continual... continual um, call to bust taboos, which again I think comes uh, from what Pete's saying about your generation, my generation. You know, and when I listen to Jonathan Ross, it's very, very familiar to me. I do feel that is my sensibility of the 80s. Um, but the same, and, and I think it's sort of drawing on what seems to be radical from what they thought the 60s were about. Uh, but it becomes this uh, really, really very childish attempt to break actually completely fragile taboos that really don't, uh, don't exist anymore. And I think that, that happens with uh, the sort of sex stuff as well as things like, you know, the kind of freak show TVs that we see. It's all, it's, it is all our generation that are putting this stuff up there in the name of busting taboos. And it often is very, very uh, debased. It's very exploitative, um, but always in the name of empowerment, obviously. So when you show fat people, fat people's bodies in graphic detail, supposedly that empowers as fat people's and shows us a great variety. I don't think it would be better if there were lots of varieties of bodies across uh, magazines. Uh, you know, if you want to see some bodies, go swimming or you know, go to the beach. <laughs> I mean, both yourself and Neil uh, seem to be suggesting that actually it's an impoverished public life that's responsible for, the, for, for a lot of these, you know, uh, 20 years younger, obese people, you know, that, that kind of policing of people's sex lives. So it does beg the question, why are we even talking about this? Surely then it means that that kind of uh, pornification is is a symptom of something else rather than the cause of anything. So shouldn't we just ignore this whole discussion on uh, pornification completely and ask what we want our public life to look like? The problem with what the use of the word pornification is it just doesn't capture to me what's happened when we open up our private lives to public scrutiny. 
And I think the devaluing of sex is one aspect of that, and the kind of separation of sex from relationships and other sources of meaning uh, is one aspect of that. But I, I see, I, I really think that the, when you open up your private life to public scrutiny, that 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 happens across the board in so many different ways. You know, it is when children have sex education and encouraged to talk about. Um, their feelings and to uh, have much more graphic materials that are presented to them. It's when students are encouraged to go for chlamydia tests at, Fre at Freshers' Week and are handed them at Freshers' Week. That, to me, is the opening up of the private life, which goes hand in hand with other aspects of the devaluing of intimacy. But I really think the, 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 the problem is that when people uh, concentrate on this idea of pornification or sexualisation, that always goes alongside the increasing demand to open up the private life even further so that we can then deal with this apparent problem problem and I think it's never separate from that kind of desire to hyper-regulate our intimate lives. Well in, in many ways I agree with the whole idea of, of having intimacy and having privacy and the fact that you know we should be less involved in talking about our sex lives and just get on with it. I do agree with that um, but I can also see why there are very good reasons to make certain areas of private life more public. It's because... <laughs> Which areas? Well, the way that she's talking about it is, is if we never talked about sex, then women wouldn't know what, what, what other women do. So it's quite an important thing. I mean, it's something that, okay, going back in, in history and going back in, in private lives is, you know, what happened in the 1950s is young girls didn't know how sex worked. Um, and, you know, a classic example is, um, you know, women getting pregnant without even having penetrative sex because they didn't know enough about sex to, to, that, to actually understand the mechanics of it. So I think it, everyone should have a certain amount of public knowledge and should discuss it, because without discussing it, then you don't know what's normal, you don't know how things work, and I think, again, going back to my argument about enjoyment, you know, it's, if you didn't talk about it, then we wouldn't, wouldn't know that they were supposed to enjoy it. And I think that's quite an important thing. But I do agree that there should maybe be, you know, more of a private and public life yeah, well, separation. There's, there's talking about these things informally with your friends and learning from your friends what they did. Mm. Um, and then a, a kind of education system where you sit in front of a teacher who then tells you for a couple of hours every you know, year for five years or something how, how to have sex. So are you saying that actually, you know, the, the kind of formal education where children are given you know, tips on sex and everything else. Well, we were never told how to have sex in sex education because sex education focuses on not having diseases and not getting pregnant. That's the whole process of sex education and in my but, experience so and everyone else's. But you would defend that? Um, I think it's important to know those things, but I don't think there's any discussion of how it functions or how you enjoy it. No, but I mean, and, you, and you, I would... do, you do, you do, um, you kind of think that, that sex education is, is proper and there is a role for the state in... Uh, teaching us about our Absolutely. private lives. Absolutely, and I think you could okay. do with a more comprehensive version with uh, talking about feelings and how you conduct relationships and what's, um, you know, what is normal in a relationship. I mean, maybe, you know, obviously keeping things private, but, you know, it's, it's a big problem with, with abusive relationships that people don't know what's normal, so they, they stay that, in these that, relationships. That appears to be the big argument on the panel, because I, I think Jen's point is actually that, no, that's something that's private that should be conducted outside of the formality of classroom and actually state. Anna, I think you really mischaracterised the sexting kind of phenomena as kind of something that adults do to children. Oh, no, uh, I wasn't so saying that at all. They think, do it between each other as well. Yeah, I think that's a big problem. It's a very interesting thing, actually, uh, as a teacher. You know, lots of kids are getting into trouble because they're conducting these very public sort of uh, revealing of intimate photographs and being criminalised for it, really. And I, I see it as kind of uh, a misunderstanding of perhaps the public-private thing. They haven't understood the privacy issue and, in fact, taken from adults actually through things like Big Brother, that you need to like, live every aspect of your life in public. And I think it's a very interesting phenomenon, and I think it's a big shame that you know, kids are being really treated as criminals from taking their inspiration from what adults do in the wider society. But the point I wanted to ask you about was the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomena, because I, I think it's uh, very interesting, and it comes to you know, part of your point. I think men, actually, I think there's a big mismatch between what men want and what women want. And I, I actually think to agree with Jan, men actually would like a little more sex. Some of the things you talked about, women enjoying sex. But the Fifty Shades of Grey film, what various commentators have observed, and in fact things like heat and closer, seem like what women want are actually something about lifestyle and actually consumerism, which is what people pointed out that is attractive to some women in Fifty Shades of Grey, that the guy is kind of a rich entrepreneur, and that's the kind of thing that women are sort of excited about. So I think there's a big mismatch between what women and men want. I just want to pick up on the link that Anna did, I think, between 
the uh, lap dancing and the wider sex trade, which I think is quite an important link. And I think one that's not very commonly made in terms of there's no, there's no coincidence that areas in the world where have um, accepted more and more public sex markets um, also have the consequences of is bringing more wide-ranging violence against women, child pornography, child prostitution. It's very easy to make these false distinctions between different parts of the trade. And actually, if we look at the wider consequences of it, um, it has quite um, vast ranging uh, consequences. Also, I just want to make the link between public and private. Um, I used to do research with women working in prostitution, and one of the big changes within the last 10 to 15 years is the type of demands that women in prostitution are being asked to do, the type of sex that's being asked of women that you can pay for, um, which are becoming a lot more um, in the very, very hard end um, of sex, especially young men that's come through in the last, in the last five, ten years um, in terms of very kind of crude idea of what sex is, um, fist fucking, all the rest of it. Um, and I definitely think that's an important link to make, how what you look at in private in your bedroom has real consequences for many women out there. I'd like to put in a word for vulgarity. I do recognize the point that um, there might be a kind of um, unleashing of vulgarity that's unregulated and uh, somewhat boringly insane. Um, but vulgarity is a fantastically transformative thing in tension with um, um, repression that properly goes alongside it. Uh, and it's, it's how imaginations work and, and how um, uh, ordinary systems of social behavior are questioned. And uh, without that um, powerful tension between what you should think and what you feel, humor mostly doesn't work. And a lot of art doesn't work as well. So, that, that tension is real, and I think it's important in sex, too. And um, I think um, it would be a tragedy, in a way, if we, we, we took sex entirely from the realm of the irrational and uh, animalistic and um, unconscious and placed it entirely in the realm of the conscious and deliberate and considered, because it would actually cease to be sex at all. It would be uh, some weird platonic dialogue, um, uh, which we could leave our bodies... <laughs> Uh, way behind, and, and this, uh, I think, really would be a kind of a disaster. I work, I work in a school that's part of a growing number of schools that seems to be attaching a lot of significance to the correct wearing of the school uniform. Um, and I think that's partly driven by maybe concerns over sexualisation, but I think there's other agendas at work as well, but invariably it involves uh, members of the senior management team patrolling the corridors, observing uh, skirt length uh, in, in particular. Um, and I just wondered what the, the panel thought about this increased kind of surveillance, particularly of the, the female body, perhaps in, in a school context point about in defence of vulgarity because it, I suppose it's the defence of vulgarity in its proper context and I think the way that you've put it, sex is the irrational, the unconscious part of the raging gear is, is right and I think that's where we become uncomfortable when it splits over into, uh, into the public. Um, I just want to go back to something that Susie was asking earlier on um, about what, you know, why we're looking at this, what is it a symptom, is it a symptom of, I think it is a symptom of an impoverished uh, cultural life and uh, an impoverished public life and I think the, the way that Jan outlined it in terms of our generation in the 1990s uh, almost seemed to be uh, dead set on who can kind of lower the bar and lower the bar and lower the bar and obviously you only have to look at BBC Three uh, to realise how low that bar uh, can go. Um, alongside all this as well in terms of what people have said before it is the case that the more society talks about sex probably an indicator that people are not actually having uh, enough sex in its, in its real uh, relationship-based uh, context. And I think that tension between in the two also explains about the surveillance as well and the problem, problematisation uh, of intimate relationship that goes alongside uh, a slightly voyeuristic culture that's seen as some sort of tawdry compensation uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the, the real processes of relationships. I wanted to agree with you about uh, the point about prostitution. It's a, it's a big thing that people don't want to talk about in this country. Uh, there are women who are trafficked from all over the world into this country illegally who are trafficked into prostitution, and it's a terrible thing. And I think this is the big underlying thing of this idea of sex and pornography. It does affect people's lives. It affects women's lives and their deaths and everything. And um, 
as someone who came of age in what you might term the age of wide stream, uh, not mainstream widespread pornography, it does affect how people conduct their relationships. It does affect how young men go into sexual relationships and what they expect of the young women they are entering into these relationships. Obviously, there are all different other kinds of relationships. I'm just talking about one particular kind of heterosexual relationship here. But I think that is a big thing. That, that, that is my... The reason why I'm here and the reason why I want to talk about it is I think that pornography does affect people's lives. We've had questions about kind of vulgarity and imagination and then the type of sex women are, you know, prostitutes are expected to kind of effectively do. Virginia Woolf had a really good article recently. I have to say, I, I was a bit sympathetic. The, the argument was made that porn used to be a bad substitute for real naked women, but actually today real naked women are bad porn. So would you see any truth in that or would you say, well, actually, no, that, that's not the case at all? Because it does speak to this uh, kind of concern that actually um, there is something going on that's that's not entirely good, you know, the, the fact that perhaps there's more sadomasochism and fisting and the rest of it, uh, while you could say it's, it's a sense of people, you know, using their imagination, it's private, do you not think there's, there, there are any negative consequences to that? I think it's really difficult to know. I mean, I, 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 mean, if you, if, I don't think we should really be surprised that if we kind of remove stigma and shame, that then people reveal stuff that we didn't know before. I mean, it's not really... I, I, what we make of that, I think that I think it's kind of up to up to individuals really whether you partake. I mean, I don't really, I, I don't, I wouldn't really have a, a judgment on it. I mean, I, I, and the fact that it's out there, I might think, okay, well, there's certain places where that's better explored than others. Um, but I mean, I, see, I, th I don't think it's, when I say about taboo busting, my 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 concern with it is not that it's um, overly vulgar, but actually it's really really safe. It's not that we... You know, Jerry Sadovich does not have a late-night uh, chat show on Channel 4 because he's far too um, vulgar for Channel 4. Um, so the kind of... Um, you know, whenever you have a, a Channel 4 kind of vulgar programme, it's always met with a kind of uh, a, a balanced thing, which is all about the, the problematisation of people's bodies or sex or our relationships to either one of them. So, I, I, you know, I think that the, one of the worst things that's happened is the idea that we're all doing it wrong. And that particularly, it started off with the idea that men are doing it wrong, and that masculinity kind of screws up sex, and that therefore women don't enjoy it, and men need to kind of change what they do, um, which has obviously been greeted as a very positive thing by certain people. Um, but I think now we're increasingly being told that women are now doing it wrong as well, and femininity is a problem, and that what women do to their, choose to do their, their bodies is kind of screwing up sex as well. And I think that both of those things are, are really, really unhelpful to actually just people getting on and either consciously enjoying their relationships or <laughs> exploring whatever passions and drives they might have. To respond to your um, Virginia Woolf uh, quote, I mean, again, sometimes these things, it's very hard to decide, but um, in the 1980s, I think, um, you know, young women at university, they uh, certainly didn't aspire to be as airbrushed, perhaps, as the way that women are presented now. And I do think, I, I do instinctively think there's a, there's a pressure for young women to uh, look like that. But I, I think, again, it's that mismatch between uh, what women think that what men want. And I think that's where the problem is in terms of uh, men are probably just happy to get anything, really. Or, or don't, perhaps just, <laughs> maybe, just, uh, maybe, just, maybe just speaking from bitter experience at the moment. But, but, there, is a, but there, is a, there is that kind of mismatch uh, between what women think uh, what men want. And I think what men want is actually just a lot more real and a lot more human. Uh, than the way, that, the, the way that women are presented and the way that some girls may internalise what they think men want. Um, hi, I'm a, a, a student myself and I find it bizarre that you can almost legitimise the working of female students in lap dancing clubs by saying, oh, well, they're funding their university degree, therefore it's okay. I mean, I, you know, I'm now on my second degree, you know, the consequence of doing architecture, but I find it, I have never had to, I've never felt the need to go and, you know, search for work in these kind of places. I worked in hotels and restaurants and was, you know, as capable, if not more capable, than many of my male counterparts. And I was just interested in whether, you know, whether it does, a lot of people do feel that it's a legitimate excuse to have these women working, you know, quite publicly in lap dancing clubs, and whether it's a product of society, that whether these women don't feel like they can gain legitimate employment in other areas, um, and whether it's a sort of broader, uh, I guess, sort of place in society that, you know, maybe women, this is the only way that they can earn money is by using their bodies, you know, in these kind of sexual acts. And I feel that, you know, saying that, well, they're going to university, you know, it doesn't really matter. I feel like that's not a legitimate excuse for these women. Okay. 
Um, hi, yeah, just, just very, very two quick ones. One for um, Anna Percy right at the beginning, uh, where we were talking about the sexualisation of the media. And I was wondering whether uh, there was a sort of a conflation between two different things there. Is it the sexualisation of the media that might be considered a problem or the, the inequality of the sexualisation of the media? For example, if there were more sort of Aussie bomb, male bomb shots to counterpart the female sort of boob shots, would, would that be more morally acceptable because then it's not a, a split upon gender lines and also very very quickly with regards to the, uh, the sort of the sexualization of the media and possibly is it a fact that we're having not enough sex as a, as a society, does this, does this show that we're possibly doing sex in the wrong way, is this, is this the, the death of monogamy? Well, I'm not offering myself an Aussie bum shot but uh, I, I dropped in on the Royal Courts of Justice uh, and uh, found myself watching the, some Scottish comedian of whom I'd never heard called Boyle uh, had the chutzpah to bring a defamation case against the Mirror. And uh, it struck me, and he'd been on the BBC, I don't know which outlet, uh, the race for the bottom uh, that we wouldn't have in the colonies. We'd, he, he talked about the, pus the Queen's pussy being haunted, uh, signed himself off as Heil Hitler, and the managing director of the BBC, uh, the reaction to his comment about the Queen... Uh, was he acted as if his ass hairs had been set on fire. I mean, I watched this in disbelief because we wouldn't have it. And I'm wondering if maybe there's so many media outlets here that, that permit somebody like that to just go to the bottom and have a following. It, it, from what I understand, BBC4 is not like that, but maybe the plethora of outlets facilitates uh, that sort of behaviour. You don't have to go far back in history to find a society in which women were genuinely repressed and had no rights and, and had to wear corsets. Um, or you could alternatively get on a plane um, to somewhere like Saudi Arabia and find very much the same situation today. It seems to me that this um, so-called sexualisation, this um, uh, explosion in, in pornographic imagery, has, has gone in tandem with a, an enormous and continuing opening up of women's opportunities in wider society. And, and instead of seeing um, sexual imagery as perhaps um, a reaction against um, uh, feminism and against women's um, greater role in society, we should see it as perhaps a manifestation of it uh, and ask why it is that a society that gives more freedom uh, to women produces this sort of imagery and, and maybe that and whether or not that is a good thing, and perhaps it is a good thing. There used to be an establishment like the Conservative Party, the church, these people laid down the moral line. Um, and that's what's gone now. So last, the other night I was watching uh, Piers Morgan, and he was, uh, he was interviewing uh, Felicity Kendall, and he was asking some really crude questions, like uh, with her next partner, well, you were at it like rabbits. And I thought, well, I wasn't brought up to talk to ladies like that. You know, it's really... And, Piers Morgan is like a, a, an establishment figure, so in the absence of that other side, you know, we we, we're talking about the dialogue between vulgarity and conservatism. With the, the collapse of that other side, you've just got the vulgar, and you get someone like an establishment figure like Piers Morgan behaving in that way. So I'm, I'm thinking, so is it me who's a bit strange here? You know, you're not quite sure. And, and the attitude about male satisfaction in pornography, and I think, I don't know if it, if it is male satisfaction, it's male, male fantasy, and again... I don't know if that encouragement of fantasy, I don't know if that's a, a healthy thing, divorced from reality. And I think that a lot of this discussion has been about public and private, which is certainly, you know, at, at least half the debate. But I think there's something else going on as well, which is really around uh, the points that we're being made here about, you know, the fact women do have opportunity nowadays. They do have a lot of freedom. Yet actually, uh, the, the good life seems to not necessarily being at the head of the boardroom, but being, you know, a page three girl, a lap dancer, you know. It's quite striking that, uh, you know, a most famous, I say most, a lot of famous celebrities today have a sex tape. They don't have a good book. Um, so is, is there something going on here in which the, the, the conception of a good life, you know, the idea of a woman entering uh, the public sphere with all of this opportunity has perhaps shifted what, what she wants to be away from, um, you know, a, a great author or poet and, and more towards uh, being photographed in Closer magazine in her size six bikini and feeling good about it. Well, on that point, I'm not so sure. There's been a number of surveys where teenage girls have actually said, you know, they still aspire to be a doctor. Uh, and a lawyer and a writer rather than necessarily a page three, three model. You know, I think uh, 
you know, young girls will actually see through that. Uh, it can be tainted by class in the sense that working class girls uh, might, um, you know, have that expectations uh, of that because they might not, might not have the expectations of, uh, uh, of going through higher education. So it could, it could be tainted through class uh, rather than anything else. But I think recent surveys on that suggest that girls still aspire. Uh, to the good life rather than, uh, rather than anything else. Um, just on, on the comments on the front about um, sort of crude comedians and stuff, I, I think what happens, because we have an over-sensorious climate, it does encourage cardboard characters like uh, Frankie Boyd and Jonathan Ross, and I think that's, that is the flip side of a very sensorious society in the sense that everything is sensorious regarding proper content uh, over ideas, but it seems the only channel you can be free about is crudities. Uh, in that are you at it like rabbits uh, way that you pointed out there. So I think there is a relationship between, uh, between the two there. And um, it's an interesting point that you also raised in about the decline of traditional conservatism as, as kind of sort of unleashed, uh, if you like, uh, a more crude tone in society. And I think just to put that into perspective, um, again, in the 1970s, a lot of people were also hostile to that conservative view because they did see it as very constricting uh, and very narrow and also very hypocritical. Uh, but again, equally, I think the public have got that sense uh, when they are taken for a ride or they have that sense where they know they're being patronised uh, uh, and being kind of sneered at. I, I wanted to uh, go to the argument about uh, young women uh, doing lap dancing or whatever to, to go through education. And I think this is a thing of young women believing that what they have to offer is their bodies and the idea that, oh, yes, well, they're going to university, that's fine. So it's another case of women having to do everything that men do but twice as hard. The idea is, is that young women are doing this by choice, so it's fine. And it's the same with glamour modelling, it's the same with all of these things. But are they choosing their choices? That's my opinion. And I think that, that they have grown up in a society where they believe that the thing that they have that is most worthy of offering the world is their body, their image. And I think that's a very dangerous society that we live in. Um, and also, you know, again, again the idea about uh, it all being about men's pleasure and not about women's pleasure. And it's, it's all about the image rather than the actuality of sex and relationships and things like that. And again, to uh, re state the point that all of the things I was talking about, the uh, media, the way that uh, society is sexualized pornography, does affect real people. It does affect real women. Um, it affects the way that, that women walk down the street and have things said to them or are attacked or raped or, you know, uh, forced into prostitution. So I think this is the thing, is that uh, this is not just a, a kind of a question of, of what, what are we viewing in society it's, um, and how does it affect people. It actually really does have serious effects on how people live their lives. I'm thinking of having a T-shirt made which says, I survived the 1970s. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was worse. <laughs> Believe me, it was much worse being a girl then than it is now. Um, and I think the reality was that, you know, you had to be cheerful and you had to be uh, pretty. Uh, and all of those kind of things were, were far more kind of homogeneous than they are, than they are now. And I think that what we, what we have is, yes, we have an ambivalence about work and public life, uh, which might explain why uh, some girls are, are kind of less... Uh, uh, driven towards uh, um, working life, but that comes from all kinds of quarters, not least things like, for example, the idea that parenthood is the most important job in the world, and that's, that's the job. Um, you know, in the same way that, for example, you know, the, the expression of your bodily identity or sexual identity is seen as being an incredibly important thing to work on, which is exactly what happens in schools. Uh, going back to somebody's point about skirt length, this preoccupation with the sexualisation of childhood in particular and with helping young uh, teenagers to develop their sort of bodily, their thoughts about their bodies and their thoughts about their sexuality, I think is something that really uh, actually is a, you know, is a very, very unhealthy prism through which to relate to young people at that age, uh, not least because it imposes adult concerns upon their developing sexuality and their developing bodies. So I think that there's all kinds of really uh, unhelpful and uh, quite dangerous trends, but they're not the ones that most people are saying are the unhelpful and dangerous trends. And I, I think that the, the preoccupation with the idea that kind of sexualization is as it ever was, um, or kind of patriarchal or whatever, is really obscures some other much more important things to try to engage with. Okay, can we thank our speakers?